introduce the third speaker of uh, the day, Cook Sandra Moraro from the University of Waterloo in Canada, and she'll talk about solutions of the Waffa Witten equations. Sandra, please go ahead. Thank you very much, and thank you very much uh, for the invitation. As I was uh, mentioning earlier, the last time I spoke at the MCA was in 2017, so four years ago, and it was in Montreal. So I didn't have to travel that far. I had to travel less far today, but uh, hopefully next time we'll all be able to see each other in person. So thank you very, very much for the invitation. Okay, so I want to tell you about a more recent project, um, and it's all joint work with uh, uh, Fernando Marquesano and Rafaele Savelli, who are both uh, physicists. And the project started when I was spending uh, some time at uh, the Simon Center. Uh, there was a um, thematic program on uh, Higgs bundles and uh, Hitchin systems. So this is where the, the and this was two years ago in 2019, and this is where the project started. Okay, so what I'm going to do is, this is a little bit the outline of the talk. I'll motivate a little bit. I'll go through some uh, um, rather familiar material to most of you, which is just quickly review uh, 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 how we think of stable bundles, both uh, in algebraic geometry and gauge theory, and also um, Higgs bundles, uh, sorry, uh, yeah, stable bundles and Higgs bundles. And then discuss a little bit what happens in higher dimensions, that there are two possible directions that you can generalize these concepts. And uh, the uh, Witten equations are one, one of the possible directions that one can uh, generalize the notion of Higgs bundles uh, to higher dimensions. And so I will uh, then discuss a little bit um, what are some of, the con some of the topological constraints on the underlying manifold in order for uh, these equations to have solutions. And then, and the last part uh, is uh, completely motivated by the physics that uh, of these uh, solutions, there are some special ones which are called T-brains and, uh, and that, I, uh, that I will uh, discuss a little bit and again, uh, tell you about some of the necessary conditions uh, on um, the topology of the underlying manifold for such uh, solutions to exist. Okay, so this is the, the plan for the talk. So as I mentioned at the beginning, should be familiar to many of you, but I thought that it's not a bad idea to see how things generalize, to see a little bit, to, to recall some of these notions. Okay, so I'm going to assume that M is a compact complex manifold and that it emits a Kähler metric. Uh, the fundamental form, whose fundamental form is omega. A lot of what I'm saying you could do on any compact complex manifold as long as you use a Gaudichon metric, but uh, I'm going to stick to the Cater case. And then I'm going to consider smooth vector bundles on that manifold. So let's call them E. And on not just smooth vector bundles, but I want to also consider some holomorphic structures. So for us, uh, I really, in today's talk, I'm really going to be thinking of them as partial connections. So connections that take smooth sections to smooth sections, um, uh, tensored by some uh, holomorphic, um, sorry, anti-holomorphic one form. And, uh, and the pair is what I will call the holomorphic vector bundle. And uh, when one, um, a natural problem is to consider the, uh, the set of all these objects and in particular their moduli spaces. And then in order to have well-behaved moduli spaces, usually one contains, uh, considers the stable objects. And to define the stability, one needs a notion of degree. So let me recall, I'm going to be using slope stability um, and then for, for the notion of the degree, how do you define the degree of a holomorphic vector bundle? Suppose that you start with such a holomorphic vector bundle. Then to define the degree, all you need is to pick a Hermitian metric on the vector bundle E, and then take the curvature of the associated turn connection. And you can use that to define the degree as follows. You will simply integrate the trace of the curvature of the turn connection wedged with uh, the n minus one power of um, uh, uh, of the omega, and I think I forgot to mention. I'm now realizing that by here the n is the complex dimension of uh, the manifold. I forgot to mention that on the first slide. I think. Okay, so this is uh, the standard way of defining the degree. It be, it is an integer if omega is uh, Kähler. Um, and uh, now we define the slope as simply being the quotient of uh, the degree of the bundle divided by its rank. And you can, of course, also define the, 
the degree of any torsion free sheave by simply taking the degree of its determinant um, line bundle divided by the rank of the sheave. Okay, so that's how we define the degree. And using this definition of degree, we have the notion of stability. Okay, so what is a stable bundle? Then we will say that a, a vector bundle is stable if for every proper subsheaf of, of this um, a stable bundle, the slope of the um, subsheaf is strictly smaller than the slope of the vector bundle. Um, and then we also need the notion of polystability and we'll just say that the vector bundle is polystable uh, if it is the direct sum of stable subbundles of the same slope. Okay, so this is uh, the uh, algebraic geometry side of things. And then how does it tie into the gauge theory? Well, one can describe, it, it just so happens that all these stable bundles correspond to special solutions of what are known as uh, the Hermitian-Einstein equations. Okay, so um uh, if we uh if we start with our holomorphic vector bundle e and then with this holomorphic structure del bar e um we can consider her mission metric let's call it a little h again on on this uh, holomorphic vector bundle and then if the curvature of the turn connection satisfies this equation then uh you will say that it is um uh, that the metric is called Hermitian-Einstein. And this equation is what's known as the Hermitian-Einstein equation. And the, uh, um, I mean, the, the, these equations were, of course, motivated by physics, but uh, from a math point of view, the reason why they're so important is because of what is known as the kobayashi hitchin correspondence, which tells us that essentially a holomorphic vector bundle is um uh polystable if and only if it admits a hermitian einstein metric so classifying polystable bundles is the same thing as finding solutions of the hermitian einstein equations okay so this is um this was first proven by Donaldson ulenbeck yao for killer manifolds and then generalized to any complex manifolds with a Godishow metric where everything that I've stated so far applies as long as you pick a Godishow metric. Uh, and those always exist on a compact complex manifold, so that's not a problem. And this was generalized by Burta Lienya. Okay, so that is the classical story if you, if you want. And, um, and a natural question is to ask, is there a more general notion of stability? And in particular, how um, and are, can one generalize the Hermitian-Einstein equations? And then, you know, you can do this in, in many directions, but one possible direction is to, instead of considering just a vector bundle, you can consider pairs of a vector bundle and something else. And well, one of the first instances of that were the Higgs bundles. Okay, which were first introduced by Hitchin on Riemann surfaces in 1987. So I'm going to quickly, uh, uh, you know, recall a little bit how uh, how these are defined. Okay, so so far we're only on a Riemann surface, so uh, complex dimension one. And what is a Higgs bundle? A Higgs bundle corresponds to a holomorphic vector bundle on the Riemann surface together with with what's known as the Higgs field, which is a a holomorphic um, um, map from the vector bundle to the vector bundle tensored by the canonical bundle. And the, this triple of the smooth vector bundle, the holomorphic structure, and the Higgs field is known, is what we call the Higgs bundle. And uh, one can define stability uh, for Higgs bundles. So the way that you define uh, stability is very similar to um, uh, the stability of holomorphic vector bundles. So you consider subsheaves of the, or the uh, underlying holomorphic vector bundle of the Higgs bundle. So again, a Higgs bundle is just a holomorphic vector bundle and this map five for the Higgs field that is a, a, homomorphic, a bundle more homomorphism between um, E and E tensor by the canonical bundle. And then, you know, and, and the bundle, the Higgs bundle will be called uh, stable if for any subsheaf of the holomorphic vector bundle, that is fine variant, meaning that it uh, maps uh, S to S tensored by the canonical bundle, then the slope of this fine variant um, uh, subsheaf is strictly smaller than the slope of the vector bundle. And 
Well, Higgs bundles are called polystable if they are the direct sum of stable Higgs subbundles of the same slope. Okay, so the only extra invariant is that you only consider subsheaves that are fine variant to determine stability. So in particular, what can happen is that uh, the, you can have a situation where the underlying holomorphic vector bundle is not stable in, in the sense that it does admit some subsheaves whose slopes are greater or equal to the slope of the bundle, but those are, are not fine variant and therefore you do not consider them to determine the stability of the pair. So in some ways you're enlarging your moduli space by considering Higgs bundles. Uh, because, of course, if you start with any stable bundle, if the underlying holomorphic vector bundle is stable, it doesn't matter. Uh, uh, all, all the subsheaves will satisfy this equation that we're interested in. So, you know, you automatically, the fine variant one will also satisfy that. But now you may have situations where the underlying bundle, holomorphic bundle, is not stable, but the, it is stable as a, um, a Higgs bundle for uh, a specific uh, Higgs field. Okay, so that's maybe the, the thing to, to keep in mind here. Oh, I don't know what happened. Oh, okay. That's, um, yeah, sorry about that. I don't know what happened to that page, but uh, that's okay. All right, so that was the algebraic geometry sort of things, and now I want to get to the gauge theory. So similarly to uh, stable bundles and, Herm and the Hermitian-Einstein equations, you have that the stable Higgs bundles um, uh, are related to these um, Hermitian metrics that this time satisfied what are known as the, as the Hitchin equations. So uh, again, you just pick a Hermitian metric on your holomorphic vector bundle and uh, you will say that it satisfies the Hitchin equations if the curvature of the churn connection now satisfies this a bit more general equation, right? So you don't just have the, uh, uh, keep in mind here that the dimension is complex dimension one. So here, when we're wedging by omega n minus one, this is just going to be zero. And so, you know, you there's no wedging by a form, but uh, we're adding this extra term, which uh, involves the Higgs field for, for your Hitchin equation. So in particular, you see that when the Higgs field is zero, right, you can always choose the Higgs field to be zero, then you're just, it just reduces to the usual Hermitian-Einstein equations. Um, so they're just a, a natural generalization of those equations. Okay, and then what you have is that also in this case, you have a Kobayashi Hitchin correspondence that tells you that um, a Higgs bundle admits a, um, a metric that satisfies the Hitchin equations if and only if it is polystable. Okay, and this was proven by um, Hitchin and Simpson. And, you know, moduli spaces of Higgs bundles have been extensively studied for the past 35 years, well, 30, 35 years. So, you know, uh, we, we know a lot about them. Okay, so that was the review just for what happens over, um, uh, you know, so we started with just the stable bundles and we generalized a little bit to these pairs, the, the Higgs bundles and uh, over a Riemann surface. And now what happens if we want to consider these equations in high, uh, over a manifold of higher dimension? Okay, so there are two natural ways you can do this. Okay, so we're going to assume that we have uh, M is a compact complex manifold now. And you, uh, you start with the Higgs bundle, so a holomorphic vector bundle in the Higgs field. And, but the Higgs field, you can define it in two possible ways that generalize what happens over a, um, a Riemann surface. So Simpson generalized it as follows as um, just the Higgs field is a, um, a bundle, um, holomorphic bundle um, morphism from E to E tensored by the uh, holomorphic cotangent bundle, okay? And whereas Waffein Witten decided to generalize this from as uh, saying, well, I mean, it's the most direct generalization actually as being a holomorphic uh, bundle map from the, the bundle to the bundle tensored by the canonical bundle. So when, when M was a Riemann surface, this was the definition of the Higgs field. But Simpson uh, chose to generalize it by replacing on a Riemann surface, of course, the canonical bundle is simply 
the um, holomorphic uh, cotangent bundle. So this is also a natural way of uh, generalizing uh, the notion of a Higgs bundle. Okay, and you know most of the work has been done in the uh, from using Sinsum's definition. So you have quite a work that has been done in this case and a little less in in this case. And uh, and so it is the the Waffa Witten uh, generalization that I want to discuss today. Okay. So, uh, so as I mentioned, so when you're on a Riemann surface, when the complex in dimension one, these both these de these definition corresponds to Hitchens' definition of uh, Higgs bundles, and uh, oops, um, and uh, in both cases, um, we define polystability, stability, and polystability in the same way as we did for Higgs bundles on uh, Riemann surfaces. Okay, so a lot of I'm not going to. Um, uh, so I'll go more quickly over these things, but, uh, and, and I want to say that um, the waffa witten generalization makes sense over any manifold of higher dimension, and we're looking at, you know, not just uh, complex dimension two, but I'm just going to, for simplicity, focus on the case where uh, M is a complex dimension two uh, compact manifold, so a complex, um, compact complex surface. Okay, so. Let me, um, unless there are questions, let me just now uh, go over what is known about uh, the waffa witten equations. Okay, so as I mentioned, I'm going to now assume that I'm an, I'm in a, I am on a compact complex surface. And, you know, we're, as I mentioned, we're defining stable Higgs bundles exactly the same way here. And the definition of the Higgs field is, uh, so it, it's taking values in the bundle tensored with the canonical bundle. Oops. And now the waffa witten equations will be, so it's almost like the Hitchin equations, except that now we're wedging everything by omega. And as I mentioned, if you were in the case of, uh, uh, I mean, you know, if you were, if the M, uh, if the dimension of your, um, of the complex manifold is N, here you, you'd be wedging by N minus one. This is what the waffa witten equations are. And so in particular, when the dimension is, com the complex dimension is one, you're just getting the Hitchin equations. And, uh, and for us, because we're on a complex, uh, on a compact surface, this is just equal to one. So this is uh, wh what we have, okay? Okay, so these are uh, the waffa witten equations. And, um, <clears throat> and uh, as I mentioned before, uh, it's important to know that when the Higgs field is simply zero, then you're just back to having just the Hermitian-Einstein equations. So we're really interested in the figure out what's, uh, if it's just finding uh, cases where the Higgs field is not zero. So this is one of the first things that you, you want to be considering. Uh, and, you know, I want to give you some uh, what are what we call the vanishing theorems to some constraints on the on the surface, ensuring that you have existence of these non zero Higgs fields. Uh, but let me just first uh, tell you a little bit about what is known uh, about these solutions to the waffa witten equations. And I'll give you a bit more detail right after. So uh, Waffa Witten already had some original uh, results about uh, the, the vanishing that we confirmed, and but we're able to generalize a little bit about certain topological constraints on the underlying manifold and to ensure that you do have possible non-zero fees. And then you also have a Kobayashi Hitchin correspondence that was established by uh, uh, Yuji um, Tanaka in 2014 for these systems. So you have, and it's the same. It'll the the correspondence tells you that stable Higgs bundles are in uh, you know essentially in, um, uh, sorry uh, uh, a Higgs bundle is stable if and only no polystable if and only if it admits a Hermitian metric that satisfies these the waffa witten equations. So that was established by Tanaka in 2014. And then 
Um, Tanaka with Richard Thomas studied a little bit the moduli spaces of semi-stable Higgs bundles in this case, but in particular, not the full moduli spaces. They were looking at the C star locus because you have a natural action of C star on Higgs bundles, which is simply given by multiplying the Higgs field by a non-zero constant. And then they were looking at the, the fixed locus of that, and then they looked a little bit at, the, at these moduli spaces. And, you know, I mean, a little bit, actually, they derived quite a quite a bit of information about the C star locus, but they were focused on that. And then with um, uh, with uh, uh, they also looked at some examples uh, of uh, non non trivial um, uh, Higgs bundles where by non trivial, I mean that the, the Higgs field is not zero. Uh, but they were just constructed on direct sum of line bundles, and it's simply because they were interested in the C star locus. So, you know, they didn't want to, they didn't need to explore further. But because of uh, the motive, you know, the motivation being from the physics of what uh, Fernando and Rafaela needed, we really were, we constructed more solutions and on, on uh, where the underlying bundle is not a direct sum of line bundles. And, you know, so it, it was... Uh, uh, a lot of the work was just being able to find says, these non-trivial examples. Okay, so let me tell you a little bit uh, more, uh, give you a bit more detail. Okay, so as I mentioned that we are essentially, one of the thing, more interesting cases is of course, the case where the Higgs field is non-zero, otherwise the waffa witten equation just reduce uh, to uh, the Hermitian-Einstein uh, equation, so there's not much to do. And the, we have the following result that we're actually able to prove for any dimension, but I'm here, I'm mentioning for a surface. And well, the result is that if you do have a stable Higgs bundle on, on the surface X, where the Higgs field is non-zero, then the degree of the canonical bundle has to be greater or equal to zero. Okay, so this kind of gives you a little bit where to look for if you're interested in these cases where the phi is not zero. So our proof is very algebraic, but I should say that, and, and as I said, it, it really um, uh, holds for uh, any dimension, not just for the compact complex surfaces, um, but uh, I should say that it verifies something that uh, Vafa and Woodin had already done um, for surfaces using a, a Weizenbach formula. They were able to prove that if you have a compact killer surface that has a non-negative scalar character, then the um, um, the um, uh, any solution of the equations must have phi equal to zero. So, uh, so, so that is that. So that's the first, uh, it, at least it gives you some conditions. We already know in order to have a non-zero Higgs field, you need the degree of the canonical bundle to be greater or equal to zero. Okay. So, but they, um, motivated by the physics, they were not just interested in finding Higgs bundles where phi is not zero, where the Higgs field is not zero. They also were interested in um, in um, bundles where if you take, so this is part, you know, this commutator that you that is appearing in the waffa witten uh, equations, they also, this is motivated by the physics, they want to make sure that this is not zero, okay? So we wanted to, uh, to find um, a, a possible, to be able to determine some conditions where to, that will ensure that this is non-zero and also compute examples where uh, the commutator, the, this, um, this commutator was not zero of the Higgs field uh, with, its, uh, with its dual. Okay, so this is, uh, um, so I, I should mention that already, if you want this commutator to be uh, non-zero, the, the Higgs field has to be non-zero. So, by the previous result, it forces the degree of the canonical bundle of the surface to be greater or equal to zero. Uh, but we can actually make this a little bit uh, more, uh, obtain a strict, we were able to obtain a strict inequality. So, um, so the result is the following, for necessary conditions um, for the existence of T-brains. So the T-brains are the Higgs bundles where the commutator of the Higgs field with its dual is not zero. 
And then the result is that in that case, if there exists such a T brain, then the degree of the canonical bundle of the surface has to be strictly positive. So it really forces the compact complex surface to be either proper elliptic or of general type. Um, and you know, the I'll give you just a little sketch of the proof. I mean, uh, let me see how much time I have. I think I'm okay. I think I still I'm I'm still okay uh, to be able to give a, a, a slight idea. Um, so, you know, as I mentioned on the previous slide, if, um, you, you need the phi to be non-zero. So, because if, uh, um, uh, because, you know, if you, the degree of the canonical bundle by the previous result, if the degree of the canonical bundle is uh, strictly smaller than zero, then phi is, uh, the, the Higgs field has to be zero if it is, um, a, a T brain, if it is a solution of the Waffa Witten equation. So, um, and so we just need to check that when the degree of the canonical bundle is zero, then this commutator it also has, happens to be zero. So it'll fail to be a T brain. And uh, so, you know, you break it up into two cases. You know, the techniques are, are quite standard, you, but you just have to work through all the, uh, uh, the, the cases. So when the canonical bundle is trivial, then you can prove that in this case, the, the Higgs field, well, first of all, the Higgs field, if the canonical bundle is trivial, is simply going to be a holomorphic uh, map from uh, E to itself. So it's just a, an, an endomorphism of the bundle. And you can show that in this case, if uh, it is a solution to the waffa wooden equations, then that phi will simply be a multiple of the identity. And so its commutator, the commutator of this with its, uh, with its dual will be zero. And then because polystable bundles are just uh, direct sums of stable um, bundles, then you the that case will, will follow through immediately that you also have that when the canonical bundle is uh, uh, is trivial, then uh, it forces automatically any Higgs field, um, any non-zero Higgs field to still have uh, the property that the commutator of the Higgs field with its dual is zero. Okay, so th this is how you prove it. And then for the general case, if the canonical bundle is not trivial, but the degree is zero, then you can cover the surface with by a finite cover. It admits a finite cover by a complex, com compact complex surface with, oh, and I forgot to write it. That's uh, missing the, the key ingredient where the canonical bundle is trivial. And then you pull everything back to the covering surface and then work there and you end up with your, the result. So that's how you prove it. Okay, so these were our necessary conditions. And um, because um, uh, it was, you know, the, we were, they were both very interested in finding examples of T brain. So these uh, stable, um, Higgs bundles that um, um, where the Higgs field, the commutator, the Higgs field with itself was not zero. Uh, uh, we uh, so you know we we use this result, and uh, so let me. I will just finish the talk by uh, giving you uh, some examples. Uh, so of course, a very simple way of doing it is that if you start with a compact complex surface. So we know it will either have to be proper elliptic or of general type. And suppose that you have two holomorphic line bundles, let's say uh, L1 and L2, with uh, the degree of L1 strictly smaller than the degree of L2. And the extra condition is that there is a non-zero section of the homomorphism, and a non-zero homomorphism from L2 to L1, then you can create this Higgs field and it will have the desired property that uh, its commutator with the commutator phi with its dual is non-zero. And so it'll be a T brain. But of course, this is assuming that such a section exists. And you can show that we worked with proper elliptic surfaces for now. This was what we considered that you can always do it. And not only that, but you can also, you, ha you have such fees that exist. But you can also construct these Higgs, uh, these T brains, um, not just uh, in the case where the underlying bundle is like here, the sum of two line bundles, but also on uh, vector bundles um, that are stable. 
so non-split bundles. So we're able to uh, to to construct uh, examples of these things. So far, just on a proper elliptic surface, uh, simply because I have expertise on elliptic surfaces, so it was a good, <laughs> an easier place to start. But you know, I think that one should be able to do it uh, uh, on on other uh, on surfaces of general type. Okay, so. This is what we what we did, and these are some uh, interesting questions that remain. I think uh, for these uh, 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 regarding these equations. So one of the first uh, question would be, you know, uh, what is the deformation theory of these uh, stable Higgs bundles and of the solutions of the waffa witten equations? So in that direction, as I mentioned a little bit. Um, uh, earlier, Tanaka and Thomas were already did a little bit of that analysis of, uh, I mean, already did the analysis, but for the C star local of the moduli space of stable Higgs bundles on, on projective, they were focusing on projective surfaces. And then, uh, so, but it would be interesting to see in general what it is. Uh, of course, coming up with more examples and maybe just even not just examples of the bundles, but also the moduli spaces having a better understanding of the full moduli space. And also an interesting question would be, um, um, oh, and, and sorry, I, I'm going, I'm jumping that uh, it, from the point of view of the physics, it's interesting. I mean, I, I mean, I'm skipping details, but uh, because there's certain invariants that you end up computing uh, that are uh, relevant from the physics point of view, and you need uh, bundles that do not split, where the underlying bundle does not split, but you know, so it, it's, it would be interesting to have more examples of those. And then finally, just maybe an interesting question would be to understand how, uh, understand a little bit better how the locus of T brains lies inside the moduli space of the stable Higgs bundles, right? Because they, they just, they, they happen to be special solutions of, of uh, the waffa weighting equation. So a special, uh, a such special subset of Higgs bundles. Okay, so th that takes me to the end. I, I have put here some uh, references of uh, uh, the, some of the work. I mean, I am sure I'm forgetting many things, but these are some references, some of the important references that I alluded to. And, uh, and thank you. Thank you very much, Sandra, for the nice presentation. Uh, are there you. talks? Are, are there uh, questions? <laughs> Yeah I, I, yeah, I have two questions. Uh, mm -hmm. First of all, uh, is there some Hitchin map? I mean, as the in the usual Hitchin. I assume there will be. This is just the beginning of the project. So I think that if anything, this is a nice project even for a student to kind of like, there's such a blueprint for a lot of this machinery to kind of work out to this case where uh, in the higher dimension, but there should be, there's no reason why all the machinery will not work. It's just that we, I was trying to answer more of their questions. They were in interested more in existence so far, but I think from the math point of view, these moduli spaces uh, should be quite interesting, right? Uh, so I think that, uh, and I imagine that yes. So the answer is, is yes, but I haven't thought about it, no. And also, I mean, in, in the usual case is you, you have the A brains and the B brains that they have some mm -hmm. Lagrangian structure and synthetic structure. Yeah. In your case, your T brains have some special structure? Actually, they do, but then I'm the wrong person to ask. I, 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 uh, if you are interested, I can send you um, so Fernando, that's how I first learned about the project I was visiting as I said, Simon Center, he gave a very nice talk where there is something very significant going on in the physics where they, I think they, these come up as the intersection of brains and somehow like, and, but, uh, you know, I'm not a physicist, but somehow the, um, I think that these are, you're maybe on a six manifold and you have brains that I think are maybe supported on something four dimensional and they intersect in something, a complex surface. And then, you know, so you, but I, I would have to go back so I can answer. I can go back to Fernando's talk as I do have it and, and I can explain to you, but there's this very significant, uh, it, it ties into the big, to the rest of the theory in, in a very specific way. Yeah. My understanding is that the T brains appear when as intersections of other uh, brains, but yeah, I'm not a physicist but 
Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, no, the, yeah, I mean, the, the Lagrangian, Lagrangian and the symplectic structures are different there. And yeah. the, the last question is, uh, do you know if they consider the, when they consider the action, the sister action, they, they have the quotient, they define the quotient, or they just look for the, for the fixed invariant locus? I think they were just looking at the fixed invariant locus, but I just realized yesterday that there is a second part to that paper, which I'm not too familiar with. So I would have to check, but I can send you, I will send you the references uh, if you're interested. It's a very, um, they're both very interesting papers. Uh, yeah, because uh, I was looking for the question, the question on, on the, the sister action. Yes, yes, you have but to I think, yeah. But, but I think in, in the first paper, they were just looking at the fixed locus, if I recall correctly. And yeah, then, no. but maybe in the second paper. But, so I will, uh, right at the break, I will take a peek and I will, set, and I will uh, answer that question for you. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Yeah, yeah you're welcome. So uh, Steve, we have some time for your questions as well. Oh, uh, thanks. Uh, thanks, Marcus. And uh, great talk, uh, Roxandra. I really enjoyed it. And uh, thank you. honestly, uh, Leticia, um, you know, asked basically all of my questions, but I'll, I'll try and, and come up with a with another one now, uh, maybe related to the last point about the C star mm -hmm. action. So, you know, the example that you gave a couple of slides back is a fixed point of the C star action. It's a type one one. Yes, exactly, point. exactly. And that's what that's why I was saying. Like they're they they're actually they are uh, so this one right. Mm -hmm. So in their paper, they were just looking at those types of uh, of um, um Higgs bundles because they you know they, they were uh, focusing on this the C star locus yeah the fixed points of the C star action absolutely yeah. and um and because I think they were just interested in that in paper I mean I can't speak for them I know that Fernando no actually it's Raffaele went and spoke quite a bit with Richard uh while he at some point he was uh, at Imperial mm. um uh, but I uh, I don't know myself why they just focused on the C star locus. Like, what was what was the motivation? If it was just the start of their uh, you know kind of uh, looking at uh, um, uh, at the problem. So mm. I, I can't explain exactly why that's what they were really just looking at. But you're absolutely correct. This is exactly the the types of bundles they were working with yeah and then because for us it's because they were not interested in the t brains i mean the t brains you need you just really want as i said you want the commutator of phi and phi star to be non-zero uh and uh and then and they particularly wanted examples where the underlying bundle was not split so you know we we were focusing more on that but uh, yeah sure you know, suppose I take, um, you know, rank R um, Waffa Witten Higgs bundles on, on one of these surfaces, you know, then, then I could be looking at uh, fixed points of, of some type corresponding to, or, or all types, uh, you know, that correspond to partitions of the rank. And, mm -hmm. you know, I could try to, to compute all of these different complex variations of Hodge structure. And I can compute, uh, you know, the the weight space and in, in the tangent space that corresponds to the downward deformations between them, and then from that I can I can you know uh, cook up a series, you know, the, the Poincaré, you know, a, a mm. kind of virtual mm. Poincaré polynomial. And I say virtual because I imagine that many things, you know, are going to be singular that wouldn't, you know, would normally be yeah. smooth in the curves case. So you get some sort of invariant, you know, this virtual yeah. Yeah. Poincaré series from from exactly this this data. And I'm just wondering if um, you know, do we know, I mean, is that, is that an interesting invariant with regards to modular spaces of Waffa Witten? Um, well, that's precisely what they did in their paper. They computed uh -huh. those invariants. Yeah. And actually now I'm maybe answering my question. Maybe that was the, yeah, maybe uh, that's, yeah. that, that's why they focused on that. Sorry. It's just, yeah. So you answered the question before no, no, I asked. That, this, so that's, thank that's you. Thank you. <laughs> no, no. Th so that's exactly what the content of that paper is. So there, like I said, there are two papers. The original one now just appeared, and uh, and then I realized that I mean that the, there is a second part where I, I was not aware of it before. That, uh, uh, but I'm not as familiar. But it's still when I quickly looked at it, uh, it's still just focusing on the on the invariants, the Waffa Witten mm -hmm. invariants. Absolutely, uh -huh. yeah. Okay. Okay. So the Waffa Witten invariants and, and these, yes. these virtual point Poincaré series are are closely related, is what yeah. you're saying. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Perfect. Thanks, Alexander. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. Well, I'll stop sharing my screen, but thank you very much for the, all the questions. Thank you, Sandra, for your uh, presentation. So let's uh, 
Thank her again. Thank you.